All right. Salt Strong, Fish Strong Nation. We're here. Tony Acevedo, Joe Simons, Luke Simons. Guys, this is going to be a good one and potentially one of the most important and powerful podcasts slash videos that we've done because this is what separates the frustrated weekend warriors and the pros. And the reason we have Tony on is because Tony's probably one of the best at this because he's forced to do it because he lives in central Florida, not exactly the saltwater capital of the world. And what I'm talking about is all about pre-trip planning and understanding the trends so that you can predict where the feeding fish will be. So Tony, let's, let's talk about you real quick in your situation and, and just in your quick 30 second view, like why is preacher planning and knowing the trend so important? Well, for me, especially just because like you said, I live at least an hour from the water and I don't want to waste my time when I get out there trying to figure everything out when I can do it at home, do my homework, figure out where I'm going to go, figure out what the weather's doing. That way I can figure out where I'm going to launch my kayak because I mainly fish from a kayak and the weather elements are pretty big factor when you're fishing from a kayak. So just being able to know what to do when you get out there, less time you're wasting out there and you can actually fish instead of trying to look for fish when you actually get out there. Yeah. I think, um, I think some of the, the most skilled and most consistent fishermen that I've met and including some guides, like they live in like places like Polk County, like right here in the dead center of Florida. And it's because they've gotten so good and so used to, to doing that pre-trip planning. Tony, you and I have talked about this before in some insider videos, uh, that whole Abe Lincoln quote. You remember that one where Abe yeah. Lincoln was famous for saying, if I had six hours to cut down a tree, I would spend the first four sharpening the saw, sharpening the ax, just getting that ax as sharp as possible. And then two hours actually cutting down the tree. So the analogy, if you haven't caught on is, you know, spending just as much, if not more time studying the fish and studying the area that you're going to be fishing that day or the next day. And then the rest of the time actual fishing. And it makes it so much more productive when you have a plan. And I, I think the irony is the closer you live to the water and some people literally live on the water, like on a canal, sometimes you kind of get sloppy, you get lazy and yours included. When I lived on the water there in Tampa, I was lazy. I hardly ever did pre-trip planning. I was like, Oh yeah. Worst case, just 15, 20 minutes, an hour of my time. But doggone, like I would have been so much more productive if I had just taken a little time to pre-trip plan and, and study the trends and the biology, which is all we're going to talk about for the rest of this podcast. So, Luke, you there as well? I'm here. Lukey. Locked and loaded. So, and we're going to talk about you too because you're actually going out tomorrow, weather permitting. And we'll talk a little bit about your pre-trip planning and kind of how you do it, what you're looking for, what kind of notes you're taking, and just kind of the overall game plan. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, it gets pretty complex and like the inshore slammer, you know, has it all. I think it's where Tony at least got, got a lot of the, at least where he started, he's, he's brought along a lot of his, uh, his own stuff onto it. But the, like the general rule, just like for somebody who's just starting out, is check the weather, you know, no, obviously check for storms just for safety. That's what I'll be keeping a close eye on for tomorrow. We have a big system. Like she's literally thunder just, just, uh, just happened in case you heard it, but, uh, going through a storm right now but uh yeah check the weather for safety make sure to not get stuck in lightning storms always have a backup plan wherever you're going to be uh but more importantly yeah, check the wind direction um especially for kayakers uh like yeah tony does a lot of kayak fishing i take my paddleboard out a lot the wind is a huge deal and you need to know which way it's gonna be blowing for the entire day um sadly you know the the weather predictions aren't always right, but they're generally correct because uh, some days the wind will start coming out of the west and then turn from the east. And if you don't plan for that, you're going to be in for a big and a, a rude, uh, a big surprise that uh, that will not be good. I think, yeah, Tony, you had some crazy footage crossing the Mosquito Lagoon on that windy day. <laughs> yeah, there was one day, it was saying at most 15, 16 mile an hour winds from the southeast, and Mosquito Lagoon runs as most people know from uh, Northwest to Southeast. So me and my buddy were out there, we were behind a little cove. We heard the wind picking up, but we didn't think anything of it because we figured out oh, we'll get across just fine. 
Turned out the wind decided to blow from the west southwest from about 25 miles an hour, gusting up to 30. <laughs> as soon as we turned out of that cove, we couldn't turn into the wind. So we had to sit on an island for like two hours, just wait for it to calm down. Yeah, so that, that's just dangerous. And, that, and the weather uh, the weather didn't, you know, kind of led you astray on that one, the weather forecast. Sometimes it happens, but it was a windy day and, and always plan for a little bit worse than whatever the forecast is just to be safe. Yep. So, yeah, the pre-trip planning is first of all important just for safety just for overall safety even if you're on a boat you need to know what the uh what the weather's gonna be doing yeah but, but then secondly you know after the weather okay you, you know what the what the wind's gonna be doing you know what the uh the the uh the tides obviously check the tide chart that's that's number two is just make sure you know what the tides are doing mosquito lagoon you really don't have any so it's all based like wind wind uh, wind based tides um and then thirdly and most importantly i believe is to always look at satellite maps and as joe said before even if you're fishing areas that you fish a lot just it's just like shocking how you know i look at the same place over and over again and then I'll, I'll notice a little oyster bar that's like around a cove that i've never fished or a pothole that i've never noticed before and um you know this is it's just such good information on those satellite maps that it's totally free and only takes like five, 10 minutes to glance over. And uh, it's just so, so important. And, and as far yeah. as like picking spots and planning the routes and all that stuff. And yeah. these satellite maps, you know, there's not just Google. I mean, Google's probably the one that most people use, but you got Bing and now you got Google earth and you got MapQuest. And th as this, you know, this technology gets easier and easier for these companies and these satellites, there's more and more satellite images being updated every single day now. I mean, so a lot of the stuff we were looking at, like we did a webinar, I, I, I want to say it was like six months ago. And then we did a similar rep webinar recording using the same spots and like, it looked completely different. So, I mean, they're, they're getting more and more updates uh, on there and more and more different views of these spots. And like you said, Luke, I mean, it's almost like watching a movie, except the movie's kind of changing. Every time you go back, you see something new. You're like, man, I didn't know that was there. There are so many cool things when you can find. So uh, can you show your screen now? Like, can you kind of walk, walk through for those listening to the podcast? Obviously, if, if you are listening to this in the podcast, we're going to have this on video as well. So you can check this out on YouTube on our uh, Yeah, Let me see if I can figure out this uh, share screen thing. Yeah, for those who are watching on our website or on YouTube. Oh, I think I figured it out. Yeah, so weather permitting, I'm going down to Sarasota tomorrow. And I, my, like my passion is going to new areas that I've never fished before. And that is what's on the, on the plan for tomorrow. I've never, let me just zoom out. Can you see the screen first of all? Yeah. Yep. Sweet. So I've never been down to Sarasota. Um, I've been upper Sarasota. I've never been to this little, uh, this Southern Sarasota area. And I realized that there's a, uh, a boat, a boat launch, um, down here. So I've checked the weather, you know, the, the wind's going to be coming from the South and pretty strong. Um, there's high chance of rain. Um, so it's going to be 50, 50, whether I can even go and I'll just check the radar in the morning when I get up, cause I might have to change locations, but it's going to be incoming tide. And so I'm going to have basically, I'm, I know I'm going to have strong current, so I'm pretty confident that's going to be, it's going to be good. The bike should be hot. And the reason why I, I just check the tides, check the weather. And given that the wind's coming from the South, you know, there's going to be a lot, the wind's going to be pushing water through this little funnel. So I know this area is gonna be a uh, very strong current, which is good because the currents moving the water, you know, the tide-based current is, uh, is going the same direction that the wind's going. So they're basically gonna be compounding. So anyhow, so what I'm doing, I'm just looking for oyster bars, I'm looking for points, I'm looking for potholes, I'm looking for just any type of structure I can. And uh, like this area right here is probably gonna be an area that I target, you have, two points, you know, two, two mangrove points. And this pocket right here is a, uh, this is a pothole. This is a large pothole. You can see that's just a, a current trough and seagrass all around it. So there's just multiple forms of structure in one little area. And typically when you see that, it's going to, it's going to happen just a high probability of having fish, you know, nothing's perfect, but you can just whittle out, you know, the, uh, you know, as we all know, 90% of the fish are like 10% of the waters. So you can, uh, you can really isolate the areas that are most likely to have the most fish in like five minutes of time, even if you've never been there before. So I've never been here before, but I'm pretty confident that I'll have a very good chance of catching some stuff here. 
as well as these islands out this way. And there's some cool looking oyster bars uh, just a little bit north. And the fact that I know which way the wind's going, I know, and I know it's going to be strong, but I, I'll just be checking out areas that are at least a little bit wind protected. I don't want to be getting just blasted by waves. So like this little cove right here will probably hold some fish. You got some oyster bars, some points, you got some thunder in the background, probably telling me not to go. Um, but whether I go tomorrow or some other time, right, these same type of spots are going to be good. I'm just going to, you know, take into account whatever the the tide and the wind direction is going to do and make slight alterations. Cool. H how many spots are you picking? When you're doing I do your at least five. Five. Okay. Yeah. What about you, Tony? Uh, usually about three or four around the same just because if one spot doesn't work out, like I'm in the kayak, so I can't just, you know, crank the engine and go five miles down the river. <laughs> yeah. I've got to stay somewhat close. That way, if that spot doesn't work out, I can just, throw everything back in the truck and drive to the next spot. Yeah. Paddle fishing. Cause I, you know, I did a lot of paddle fishing too. And so there's pros and cons. Like there's a, a lot of times the pros outweigh the cons uh, for a long time. I started, like when I first started kayak fishing, I was catching more out of my kayak than it was my boat. And I was like, how's this happening? But the, the kayak has a big advantage. You, the disadvantage is you just can't travel as, as fast and as far, but the advantage is when you are traveling, you're going slow. So you can usually find, a lot of fish when you're going from one one spot to another um, at least I've, I've found that over the years and it kind of forces you to to really you know really just keep your eyes peeled and and, uh, and you can get some pretty cool opportunities that you wouldn't have if you were in a boat just buzzing over it yeah that's that's why I take a good amount of time looking for a spot because like just like we said before if you have a boat you can go to one little spot nothing works out you can move if you're in a kayak you have to find a spot that has almost a lot of good spots within it that are reachable yep. that way you're not wasting your time driving you know an hour to go visit one little point you want to find an area that has you know a lot of points a lot of structure a lot of grass so you can explore a little bit that way you're not stuck in one fish in one little piece of structure and then it turns out to be a bust and you're pretty much out of luck at that point yeah yeah because i was actually eyeing this area for for bringing my paddle board originally in uh and so one cool trick with these maps, again, this, this is amazing how much information you can get. So I, I realized that this road, I can see this road, there's a, for those aren't watching, there's a road that goes basically right to the water. And I could zoom in and see, okay, that looks like that goes right to the water, that's cool. But you can grab this little, uh, this little person, do like the street view and, uh, and see exactly what's there. And you can literally go on the street like as if you were there. And you can see if it's, oh, looks like the person didn't go there. We can see if it's a publicly accessible uh, spot or not um, this one looks like it's a little park so you can literally get you know on the ground footage without going somewhere so if I was gonna bring the paddleboard I would really like to find I would really like to fish this area there's all sorts of spots in one location but you just have to find a launch point that is within distance you know within travel distance yeah so on a windy day like this I would not want to have to be crossing any bays um, and so hopefully there would be a spot somewhere in here that, uh, that is doable. Cool. Actually, there's, oh, there's a little park right here. So yeah, this is uh, this one's probably goes all the way down to the water. Yep. So this would be an actually launch point if I did take my paddleboard. Yeah. Pretty cool. You can even see people launching at it. So that's just, again, the power of these maps. You can get so much information on it. I wonder if that girl bent it over knew they were taking a picture of her. For Google. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you're listening to the podcast, you got to go watch the video. <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> all right so t tony let's uh flip over your screen screen if you don't mind i know um you have uh, a little spot you want to show in and kind of walk through how you do the pre-trip planning we'll, and we'll talk about the trends also and uh why he's pulling it up just so you all know if you're an insider you already get all this stuff but every week we're literally going out in new spots is the neat part we're going out and doing the exploring for you and not just showing you the spots, but more importantly, showing you the trends, showing you where the fish were, where the bait was, and, and even showing you this stuff right here, like why and where we were going, why we were going there, all the pre-trip planning. Uh, think of it if like you know, your, your favorite fishing guide or your favorite f fishing TV show literally showed you all their spots, showed you the pre-trip planning, showed you exactly where they caught fish, where they missed fish, what they were catching fish on, what they were hitting. Uh, it's really, really, really powerful stuff. And we upload them 
uh, for our insiders every week on top of all the exclusive tips and discounts and other things. And uh, every week new one comes out, our insiders absolutely love it because one, if they're in the area, they can go fish the same spot. Uh, most of them aren't. And so they can go recreate the spot based on the trends that we're teaching them and, and literally find identical spots in their backyard based on the season and the wind and the current and tides and variables, et cetera. So, all right, so Tony, you got uh, your screen up now. Yep. Your, this is just weather.com. Yep. Yeah, this is what I like to use to check the weather because you can get an hourly forecast of what's going on. So you just type in the general area you're going to be fishing in, like, for example, Sebastian, Florida. I was looking at a spot down there. And click on hourly right up here. That'll give you an hour by hour for, I believe it goes up to 48 hours. So you can get a good idea of what's going on. It'll show you uh, the chance of rain. As you can see, it's pretty high, uh, 70%. And then we get until tomorrow, about 7, 8 o'clock. That's usually when I like to get on the water. Rain chance is pretty low, surprisingly, up until about 11 o'clock. So I would kind of estimate. I want to fish from about 7 till 11 at least, and the wind's coming from the south-southeast, not too strong. Then I'd look over at the spot I wanted to go to, for example, over here by Sebastian Inlet. There's a park here, Long Point Park, and because that wind's coming from the south, you usually want to stay away from that wind, especially if you have storms coming through, because if you get a storm to come through, that wind's going to pick up quite a bit, but it'll usually still come from the same direction. So I was looking at this area. You have some coves. This would be a nice wind protected cove back here. Also with that rainfall, you might have some rain coming off the shoreline, maybe some uh, drainage pipes along the shoreline. You can usually find out here. Yeah. Like right here, you have a little Creek coming out. So if this pond fills up, this little backwater fills up with uh, water, this would be a good area to target some fish right there because you have some water flowing out of there, especially after those rainstorms. Then um, right out here, you have some deeper channels running along the mangroves. Good spots to look for snook and trout. And you got a nice little island there. And this little cove right here has always caught my eye. You have that nice, looks a little deeper just because you're looking at it and it looks darker there. And then you have the main channel coming through there. So you got some good current flow going right between these two islands and a little, almost like a little resting spot for fish right there. So those are definitely good things to look for. And that's another thing is actually being able to identify what you're looking at on the map. That was a big learning curve for me. I just kind of looked at the map, saw different colors. I uh, didn't really know what I was looking at. It was like, all right, that looks deeper. This looks shallower but I really didn't know what grass looked like or oyster bars and stuff like that. And some of those important things uh, when you are looking for fish and spots of fish. So that's what I would be doing. Very similar to what Luke's done. I mean, I learned a lot from Luke and you guys. So we do pretty much the same thing. And again, also be looking at the tides since this is really close to an inlet. I definitely be cautious of the tides, especially when fishing from a kayak, because if you have a strong, incoming tide and I'm trying to get back it can be really tough to get back through these narrow cuts especially in a kayak so tides are important not just for fishing but for navigating yeah Tony I've, I've fished that entire area uh, multiple yeah. times and I can vouch that the, the areas that you pointed out are, I've never fished that little cove um, but all the other areas are definitely hold fish yeah redfish in that in that first cove you mentioned kind of where your cursor is and then they have that deeper, the deeper channel um, has a lot of snook and trout. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's the cool thing where Tony's never been there before. I have, and Tony basically pointed out the same spots that I've caught a lot of fish in. Yeah, never, never fished up here. I have launched from here and I fished south going towards the inlet, but I never went up here. But after I did do this trip down here, I started looking around like, oh, this looks pretty good up here. I need to check that out next time. Yeah, and, and so every week that these insider reports, you know, I post mine you know, at least one trip a week, and then Tony does the same thing. And I, you know, I feel I've been doing using these maps for as long as really like MapQuest was the first one to come out, like in the late '90s, and I, that's when I started using them. I've used them forever, but it, you, there's never a point where you know you know everything. And so like I watch all of Tony's, and I get a lot of good tips just from him. It's just it's always good to get you know new perspectives. 
different perspectives and uh, because it's just, it's all going to be useful. So, yeah, that's another thing just from location to location, it can look a little different. Like if you look at that, then you look up here, you know, in Jacksonville or something like that, where you have a bunch of small creeks and uh, tributaries and all these little things that look different. It could be tough to really compare that and, in the inside of club, we actually do spot dissections from different areas all over, not just where we fish down here, but Jacksonville up in the Carolinas and over on the Gulf coast, all the way to Texas. And we do these spot dissections basically showing what we would do if we did go visit these spots and how we would tackle a spot. Yeah. And the, even the, even the guys from Texas, cause that's one of our fastest growing segments. I mean, it started off just in Florida and I don't think we've, we've done a ton of the spot dissections in Texas, but never one of these like on the water fishing reports. And they love it because, I mean, think of it just, just like um, in golf or any other sport or hobby that you're interested in. If you see a pro doing stuff like in slow motion, pointing out every single little thing over and over again every single week, it's, it, it, it gets in your mind like, okay, I can do this. I can recreate this. There's so much power of we call it like the looking over the, the, you know, the shoulder of seeing exactly how they're finding these spots, why, why they're going there, what they're catching, what they're catching on. And I, I want to talk about that too. You guys are both, you know, more artificial lures than live bait. I know you use both, but when you're doing your pre-trip planning and you see a spot, are you also in your mind thinking, Oh yeah, I'm going to use this certain lure, this bait gear. I do. I mean, I, I just choose, I've always been a believer of keep it simple, like be an expert with like one or two lures is way better than being good at like a whole tackle store full of them. So I literally, I, I most often, especially when I'm going to a new area, I, I will only take two rods and I'll have my number one bait for water that's less than two and a half feet mm -hmm. on one rod. And then my number one bait for water that's deeper than two and a half feet on the other. And that's all I do. I don't retie. I don't change lures. I know they work. I know that if I can put myself onto some fish, I'm going to catch fish as long as I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm matching the depth with the lure. So I literally, I'd keep it simple. I just take, if I see it shallow, you know, I, I know on the map if it's shallow or not, just, um, uh, you can see, you can easily see even in areas with murky water, you can typically see if it's, you know, it can be really shallow or not. And so I know, okay, this area, spot number one, three and four, I'm going to be using my shallow water runner. And then the other spots, I'm going to use the deep one. And then if there's a pothole or a shallow spot, you know, I, I'll just change, uh, you know, I'll just change rods real quickly, but I've, I've just found that to be way more effective than having a, you know, huge tackle box full of stuff. And that like gets used like once every year, right? You're just not going to be good at retrieving. You're not going to be able to generate strikes with it nearly as good as you would a lure that you've just spent a lot of time with. Yeah. That's a, that's the biggest mistake people make. They get caught, so caught up in all these lures and all this fancy stuff, but what's most important is finding the feeding fish, finding where they're at. You can find feeding fish. You can practically catch them on a bear jig head. <laughs> There's that, do you see that one video of the guy who, uh, I think it was in Port Charlotte, but he was on a bunch of redfish and he got uh, some pliers and, and like zip tied a treble hook to it and threw yep. it out there and literally caught a slot redfish <laughs> on a pair of like, of like uh, just silver pliers that's yep. like on YouTube. It's, it is amazing. Well, even just recently we were out filming uh, the grouper course and we ended up getting on a school of mahi and I was throwing this swim bait out there that had a hook built into it. And after about three fish, it was just a hook and I was still catching fish. <laughs> the fish were so fired up and they were feeding. I was catching these fish on a bare hook. Yeah. Finding, finding fish. It is shocking how simple, you know, like, Hey, what should you, what should I do today? You know, what's the tip, right? Hey, just find some fish. But like that, just, just having that at the forefront of the mind on every trip, it is shocking how effective that is. It's not about the lures. It's not about, you know, having the, the best gear. Obviously that stuff helps, but, um, yeah, finding the fish is so, so important. And that's the cool thing about fishing is that like every day is a puzzle. That's what you know, we talk about, uh, you know, some insiders, like every day is literally a puzzle and it's, it's he or she who can put the puzzle back, you know, together as fast, you know, the fastest is going to catch the most fish most consistently. And that, and that's what, that's why I just seen like, why I like watching all of your reports, Tony, is that, you know, every time I see, you know, the things you're doing, I apply a lot of that in my game. Yeah. Uh, just every time, you know, I just get, you know, consistently better and, and more confident. 
uh, in catching fish. Like tomorrow, if, if the weather cooperates, I go down to Sarasota. I have zero doubt in my mind that I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm at least going to catch some, some, something good, something decent. Uh, whereas before, I would be like nervous about getting skunked, like in the area that I fish all the time. And it's not because, um, you know, I'm, I'm arrogant. It's not because it's just because that I, you know, I've, I've put the puzzle together a lot and I've seen it done a lot. Um, so I have, I have no doubt that I'm at least going to have some action as long as the, the lightning doesn't chase me off the water. Yeah. That's why it's important too, to keep a log, you know, just like what, what the season was, what day you went out, what the weather was like, and if you caught any fish, and most importantly, if you didn't catch any fish, try to think of what you did wrong and how you can attack the next trip to produce results. That's real important too. Almost coincides with pre-planning, it's post-planning. Oh, that's that parlays into part yeah. two of this, right? Which is which is the trends. And I don't know if one of you guys can maybe Luke uh, pull up the trend analyzer tool, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But, you know, we were just fishing with, with Dylan and we were talking a little bit about that, about just the power of these trends. And for, I mean, Dylan Hubbard and the Hubbard family has been doing it since like 1927 or something like that. I mean, they're on the water almost every single day, unless there's like a hurricane or something coming. And he talked about his grandfather and his dad and now him. I mean, they have a log book or a journal, whatever you want to call it of literally every catch that they're and where they found them, what spots they were at, what they were using for, I mean, 80 plus years. I mean, they're literally keeping track of this every single day and that's how they can go out there every single day and put people on, on fish. And what's really neat about this, we know the power of it. And we also know people, we know ourselves and we know it's not easy to do it. Uh, my brother Luke was just crazy. I, no offense, Luke, but when you were, <laughs> When you were really getting serious and you were doing this, you were doing those tournaments. I mean, you were doing like overkill, like printing out every tide chart and like marking where you caught, like it was so much information. It was almost overkill. And so we know it it's tough. It, yeah, was, it was overkill. And we know it's tough to do it. So we've actually done it for you. And this is only for our insiders. It literally is like done for you logbook. And so we're out in the water every single week and we're just logging everything for you. These are the reports including you could see here if you're watching this on uh, on youtube or on our site you'll see the season the species caught and targeted the weather and the tide the water clarity what lures were, you'll see everything so it's like an ongoing and it's now two plus years of, of data and we have a whole little trend analyzer so you get to type in what species you want to target or what you want to see the weather and the tide the water clarity and boom it spits out all these reports for you so it really is a done for you logbook or a journal it would be like if, you know, a fishing pro just shared their, their logbook with you, but done digitally where it's all organized because that's the toughest part. If Dylan's grandfather and dad gave us the 80 years of data, it's going to take a long time to go through. That's the beauty of having this stuff uh, online. And, and we still encourage everyone to, to do your own logs. I mean, do, you know, take note of your stuff post pictures, even if it's like in an app where you can post pictures and, and look at it that way. But that, that really is besides the preacher planning and, and, and now these trends. I and mean, that is the one thing like those two things combined is what separates a frustrated weekend warrior versus the pro. Like Luke said earlier, that someone that has confidence that they know they're going to catch fish, like guaranteed they're going to catch at least something uh, out there pretty much every single time. So uh, Luke, kind of walk through this if you will maybe like click one and give an example uh, maybe one that you post and obviously for people watching it they'll be able to see it easier and kind of walk someone through who might be listening as well what's uh, what's happening and why this is so valuable yeah so first just just for those who are who aren't watching this on the podcast i'll just explain what i used to do uh, that joe referenced that was total overkill i spent a lot of time and got nothing out of it and uh, so i just want to make sure that you're not doing the same thing as i was uh, i was t i was doing a, a, a print out the tide chart as you can see on my screen but it's just like a tide chart of what the tide's doing uh throughout you know throughout the tidal cycle and i would print it out you know a hard hard copy I would get a, a you know pen and I would mark down exactly you know, like at what times I caught everything and then I would like I write like where I was, and and then I would store it right. So I'd store it and so I'd store it by month. I had folders for January, February, March, April, May. So and that part was actually smart, but I, I would just like take so much notes where it became work to like go through it all, and and I was like so focused on the individual spot 
and I wasn't focused about like the, the higher level trending information. So I was spot focused, not trend focused. And that was the problem. And, and that's what I, it made me put a ton of work and got nothing out of it. Cause in reality, a spot is just a spot. The focus should be on the type of spot. Now that, that should be the focus and the trends will help you find the right type of spot for the given, the given scenario. So if you are, you know, I guess I highly recommend taking notes or you can use our stuff, but either way, put the, the type of spot at the forefront, not the end of, not the exact spot because spots, spots are static, but the fish move around and the fish are going to move to the same type of spot given the same conditions consistently. Cool. So if you know, if you know that puzzle, you're going to be able to put it together very quickly. Um, so that was my, my soapbox. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's so important. It, it, and that's, that's the big, big mantra of the insider fishing club is it's not about the spots. It's about the trends, which is why someone in Texas can watch one of these reports or someone in North Carolina can watch a report that was done in Florida and get a ton of value from it. Cause it, it, it is, it's all about the trends. It's just, we make fun of these spot maps, even though we own them and we've gotten use out of them, but it's the same reason that, just because you own a spot map doesn't mean you're going to catch fish. Um, one of my friends said it really, really well. Um, he's like, those spot maps, it's just like a highway. It's basically saying, here's where the fish should be. You still got to go out there and find them, uh, I think, which is so true. I mean, they're basically telling you where fish should be, hopefully, most of the year. But you still got to go out there and find them, which all comes down to trends. So, Luke, scroll down a little bit and walk through, assuming someone doesn't want it done for them like we're doing what are some of the main things that, that you're taking note of uh, for these trends? Well, the main things are what we have for the, the sorting. Um, so really focus on season, you know, and, and it will probably break this out by month. We'll probably have a monthly breakout, but, but definitely focus on season, you know, especially the, the extremes like the, you know, the winter or summer, those are like the different tidal cycles are better there's science and biology involved with it, but it, you know, it's, I, I always struggled in the winter. I was pretty good in the summer for years and I hated the winter, especially after cold fronts. That was like, uh, I, I would never even fish, but that's because I was trying to apply all the summer type trends to the winter. I was trying like my summer spots to the, uh, the like the winter type, you know, types of spots and it just doesn't work and most of the time. And, but now like once I realized, oh, okay, gosh, I just need to like change. I need to totally rethink thing and think of it a different way during the winter time. Think about what they need then versus summer. And now winter's like my, my favorite time to fish because the fish are usually grouped together. It's tougher to find them, but cause they're, they're not, they're not spread all over the place like they're in the summertime. But once you do find them, you're going to be on a bunch of fish. And so, so as yeah, number one, focus on the season, um, specifically, you know, the, the, the winter, you know, the cold and, and hot, spectrums and then you know species target species if you care otherwise if you just want to catch fish you know we have we keep it open you don't have to select anything and uh weather right clear cloudy you know different lure presentations and we have rainy too but rainy and cloudy are kind of combined but i i really care about if it's blue skies or if it's cloudy you know fish behave differently they position themselves differently um tide incoming outgoing obviously very important um, they'll position differently throughout the different tidal uh, current directions and then the water clarity as well and you know, that's more for like lure color um, uh, whether it's clear or cloudy and so so those are like the again like the high level things that I now focus on instead of like worrying about the spots like I used to and back in the days and I would I would only worry about like an incoming tide and, and in reality you know fish aren't they're not swimming like two miles away from like an outgoing tide versus the incoming, they're going to be pretty close to where they were. So if you have a good spot on an incoming tide, just know that they're, t they're probably going to just shift over, um, you know, usually within like 500 yards um, so that you don't have to travel a, a long distance if you're onto some good fish. Cool. Just and then below you're using. Yeah. So below is, is get, that's when it gets into the real detailed stuff, you know, for uh, we go over like the actual air temperature. Um, here's where we talk about the wind direction. Um, and the wind speed, you know, time of day when we fished. Um, always, obviously, you know, talk about the lures used. And then we have links of like exactly how to rig them, how to use them um, for those who, uh, who haven't tried those out. Um, you know, just talk about, you know, the gear and then talk about like, the key trends, right? And, and, uh, and for most of these reports, 
and this is what I, I, I enjoy doing personally. It, it helps me, it helps me, I guess, keep, keep myself uh, challenged and, and accountable to my predictions is I, when I'm doing my pre-trip plan, I'll actually record myself doing it and I'll, I'll like talk through my, uh, my reasoning and I put, I publish that for everybody. Right. And so that way I'll, I give my predictions of where I think the fish are going to be. And then I actually go there and I hope that they're there. Right. Cause I, cause I know people are going to be watching this. So it really, uh, it really keeps me challenged and it's fun and it's cool to see, uh, you know, it's obviously, you know, most of the time it's actually pretty accurate, but sometimes it's totally off. But even on those off days, it's still, that's, you know, knowing what not to do is just as good as knowing what to do in many cases. So uh, for the, for the, the, the misses, if you will, um, I, I know that as well. We're like, hey, like this type of spot was a total bust for these conditions. And so I'm not going to make that mistake on a future trip. Um, so, so the long story short, it is just very, very important to, to be strategic and to uh, put reasoning behind what you're doing. Because even if it's wrong, it's still going to help you in the long run. You'll, you'll know not to do it again. And, uh, and so anyhow, so that's what that top video is. And the second video actually shows the trip results. So, you know, show like the on the water footage part of it. And then I'll get down to like the lowest level of Google Maps or Bing Maps or MapQuest, whichever one is best um, for, you know, whatever area that we're fishing. Um, so anyhow, so that's, that's like the, you know, the high level overview of what we're doing. But again, the the most important part of it is just focus on the type of spot, focus on like the key drivers, you know, the season, weather, tide, water clarity, and just get really good at putting it all together quickly. Cool. That's good stuff, man. And if you guys are interested in seeing this yourself, just go to saltstrong.com forward slash podcast and you'll see a place you can apply to join the insider club it's uh, completely free if you don't catch more fish over the next year a whole year to uh, to try it out and make sure it works and that you're getting value from not just from us but just the whole community it's uh it's now thousands of people and uh the community is i mean freaking amazing i mean they add so much value themselves on, on going to some of these spots or going to similar spots and talking about success they had i mean so it's just it's tons and tons of reports and trends and pre-trip planning which is uh, the big theme of, of all this so and so here's one of tony's reports you know again the same we keep the 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 the, the process the same right or he'll note you know what's what species are involved what the weather was like you know what the, the tide i guess in the he was the indian river this time so there's really not much much tidal flow in that area and the water clarity and then, right, and then just talks about the, you know, the details, the, the key drivers, the key trends he was seeing, and then, you know, then shows exactly what happened. So, um, like, I personally, I, I, I watch all, every single one of these, um, all Tonys, and uh, it's just fun to watch. And now the cool thing is some of the insiders are doing some of their own. Yeah. Uh, so that's just awesome. Yeah, and because, and, again, every, every different perspective is good no matter – how advanced you are, there's always something new to be learned. That's the, that's just the great thing about fishing is that you never, it's impossible to know it all. There's always going to be something new out or a different way to do something. And, uh, and that's why I, I just, I love, I just love learning, love learning this stuff. Cool. Yeah. Well, Tony, anything to add? Um, actually something I don't really talk about too much is part of pre-planning. I believe is getting all your stuff ready the night before you go out. Like, yeah especially if you don't fish often, you fish maybe every other weekend or once a month, you don't want to go out there with, you know, rusted hooks and leader that's been tied on there for a month, kind of getting all corroded from the old salt water on it. So I like to, you know, retie my leaders, put new fresh hooks on and have my lures ready to go. That way when I actually get out there on the water, that I'm ready for anything. There was actually a couple weeks ago, as soon as I got on the water, I was filming a, tip for our insiders and as soon as I got on the water saw some mullet moving and just to the right of those mullet there were a bunch of redfish tailing so I had a rod ready made a cast and was able to catch a fish so just think of that as part of your pre-planning too is just having everything ready to go the night before that way don't have to waste your time out there yeah that's that is uh I totally agree with that and here's uh for those watching you know here's Tony's report of that same trip yeah. <laughs> impromptu fish trip is some awesome footage uh, Tony side fishes some good reds uh but yeah so I I definitely have learned that the hard way and I continue I'm not the best morning person and uh and I can't tell you how many times when I'm paddleboard fishing 
it's essential to be able to control the paddle. And I, I made like, I have like a little rope that I wear as a belt that I can, I put the paddle in when I'm actually fishing. That way I don't have to like bend down and it's just sitting there right on my side. And I can't tell you how many times I forgot that. And if I just put all my stuff together before I left, like the night before when I'm thinking straight, um, that would save me so much frustration. I, I've done it probably at least half a dozen times. Um, so yeah, I totally agree that that doing the pre-trip plan and, and the equipment getting ready in this factor needs to be done the night before as well. Yeah. Cool. Anything else, Jens, before we uh, wrap it up? Mm, I think that's all I can think of right now. Yeah, so I say just pay attention to the details. Um, you know, just pay, pay and and don't focus on the spots. Uh, it's all about the type of spot. I, I get, you know, it's a lot of people are shocked when we give, you know, we because we, we give away our spots, and I don't see just giving away spots at all. I, I you know, it's a spot is just a spot. There's thousands of them. There's hundreds of thousands of them uh, all across the the state and the region, and it's all about the type of spot. So don't get too caught up on the individual spot. Focus more on the types of spots. Love it. So that's it, guys. The one big thing, if you got anything out of it, is pay attention to the details. It's not about the spot. It's the type of spot, which all comes down to just knowing the trends, putting a little time in, especially on that pre-trip planning. Don't get lazy. Keep a journal. And if you don't want to keep a journal, we'll do it for you. If you're one of our Insider members, we'd love to have you in there. It's not just, you can see here, if you're watching on YouTube, it's not just the trends and, and these reports. We have all kinds of tips and reviews putting new stuff up usually three to four times a week so it's not just like oh here's a new report for the month i mean we're doing stuff sometimes daily minus a, a weekend here and there so awesome awesome stuff thank you all so much for listening so much for joining please go to saltstrong.com forward slash podcast to learn more apply to the insider club if you're not a member and let us know if you have any questions or anything else that we might have left off let us know how we can help you catch more fish over now thanks guys good times later everybody